Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Building Organizational Capacity to Better Serve LGBTQ2S Plus Communities. I'd like to start by acknowledging that the Canadian Public Health Association's office, and where I'm speaking from today, is located on the original unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. They've been the guardians of this land for millennia, and CPHA is grateful for the example their stewardship provides. My name is Laura Bouchard. I use the pronouns she and her, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. I'm a project officer here at the Canadian Public Health Association, and I work on our project that focuses on building the capacity to reduce stigma related to sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections, or STBBIs, within health and social services. I'd like to cover some housekeeping items, as well as set some context for today's webinar before I hand things over to our invited speakers. So hopefully uh, you can hear me through either a headset or the speakers on your computer. Uh, due to the number of participants, we've disabled everyone's microphones. Uh, however, we will be encouraging you to interact at points throughout the webinar using the annotate function and using the Q&A and chat functions of Zoom. So if you have general comments to share throughout the webinar, uh, please post them in the chat box, selecting all participants as the recipient. If you'd like to reach us for support to troubleshoot connection problems, uh, please use the chat box to type a message directly to my colleague uh, and co-host Shireen, who will be monitoring for issues and we'll do our best to get you sorted out. There will be time left for questions at the end of today's webinar, and you can write your questions to the presenters at any point during the presentation using the Q&A function from the menu at the bottom of your screen. And please just note that the questions, uh, any questions that you share will be shared with all of today's webinar participants. And also today's presentation will be recorded and it will be made available on CPHA's YouTube channel in the coming weeks. And you'll be sent the slides from today's presentation in a follow-up email. Uh, here's just a little bit more info for uh, on screen for anyone who might be having some issues hearing right now and is trying to sort out their audio connection. So I'll just pause here for a moment uh, to share this information for anyone who might need it. Today's webinar is the first in a series of webinars that will be hosted throughout this fall and winter by CPHA's STBBI project. So we know that we can't address the stigma attached to sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections or sexuality and substance use more broadly without speaking to the ways that STBBI stigma intersects with and is compounded by other forms of oppression, such as homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, racism, sexism, ableism, classism, the list goes on. So in this webinar series, presenters from across the country will lead us in exploring ways that we can better serve diverse communities with respect to sexual health, substance use, and STBBIs. Today's webinar will be a little bit different in that we're trying to avoid limiting our conversation to the context of STBBI, sexual health, and substance use to speak a bit more broadly to the importance of considering and engaging queer and trans communities in public health promotion and practice. So as part of our STBBI project, we partner with several organizations from across the country that have a specific focus on working with health and social service organizations to better serve diverse LGBTQ2S plus communities. And LGBTQ2S plus is an acronym that I'll be using throughout the webinar to refer to lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, two-spirit identities, and the plus indicates that this is not an exhaustive uh, list or acronym. And so we're really excited to bring together some of these partners uh, with such a collective wealth, wisdom and experience to CPHA's network of public health professionals. And before we actually pass the mic over to our invited speakers, we wanted to spend some time thinking somewhat critically about our health equity and inclusion efforts within public health to kind of set the stage uh, for today's conversation. So one question that we wanted to start uh, examining today is why or how may mainstream approaches in public health and health promotion in the Canadian context fall short of addressing health inequities for diverse LGBTQ2S plus communities. And one piece of this puzzle to consider is the data that drives public health policy. And so, so much of the data that we have to understand queer and trans health 
availability and quality of services and unmet needs in Canada has been generated through community-based research and advocacy. And so queer and trans communities have really long been advocating for themselves and generating this really vital information and holding health systems accountable, which is so important. And you can think of some, just off the top of my head, some examples of these um, of community-based research projects that have really helped to define health and well-being issues and needs and concerns by and for trans communities, such as the Trans, uh, trans Pulse Project, Sex Now Surveys, um, and many, many others. Uh, but on the other hand, standardized national instruments that deal with the health and quality life of Canadians in general have been slow to include collection of sexual orientation and gender identity data. So for example, you can think about the Canadian census. Uh, so up to now, uh, it's allowed respondents to declare that they're in a same-sex relationship, but hasn't actually collected information on uh, sexual orientation. And so really this excludes anyone uh, that's single within the LGBT Q2S plus community or bisexual folks. Um, and the census hasn't at all allowed people to report a non-binary or transgender identity. Um, and then you can think about health administrative data that's collected by provincial and territorial governments, which currently cannot be stratified by sexual orientation or gender identity. And although some of the major national surveys over the past years have uh, begun to allow respondents to report their sexual orientation, some examples of these being the Canadian Community Health Survey, the General Social Survey, National Longitudinal Study of Aging, the Canadian National Health Survey um, have allowed collection of sexual orientation data. None of these have actually allowed respondents uh, to report a gender identity that is non-cisgendered. <clears throat> um, so I think it's worth noting that for the first time, the 2021 census is supposed to include a two-step question on gender identity, and we'll hope to continue to see gains in the data landscape on LGBTQ2S plus. Um, health, but uh, for now, I think that's that's a big limitation in terms of our public health policy. <clears throat> um, so next, when we talk about health equity, a question we need to be asking ourselves is which communities are implied in our work towards equity and inclusion, and which communities are not implied? Are specific populations actually named, or do our policies and initiatives sort of just champion diversity or multiculturalism um, in general? So what populations actually are or aren't explicitly included? Um, because some of these broader equity, initi equity initiatives might not specifically include LGBTQ2S plus communities in those frameworks. And I'd like to highlight um, Health Canada's uh, social determinants of health as not being um, explicitly inclusive of sexual orientation or gender identity. So uh, think about the equity policies, statements or frameworks used by your own organization. Are they specifically inclusive of LGBTQ2S plus communities? So next, let's spend some time considering the impact of using a population health approach to advance LGBTQ2S plus health equity. So the population health approach has been significant in terms of explicitly acknowledging LGBTQ2S plus populations and identifying key health disparities. Um, for example, with respect to SDBI, sexual health, mental health, and substance use. And we aren't going to spend uh, time today really diving into those particular health disparities because this information is really so readily um, available elsewhere. Uh, but if you are interested in further reading, some of the sources that are, that are cited uh, on the bottom of these slides could be a good place to start in terms of um, looking at those, those health disparities. Um, but however, so, uh, however, despite these gains in terms of increased recognition of LGBTQ2S plus communities through the population health approach, um, this needs to be balanced by also ensuring that uh, queer and trans communities are not only recognized within an illness-based focus. And I think the most obvious example we can look to um, is the kind of tendency to fixate on LGBTQ2S plus community members as a prior priority population for STDBI while missing other important priorities for health and wellness. So let's also think about the extent to which our work focuses on resilience and protective factors versus categorizing entire groups of people as inherently vulnerable or at risk. Does our work actually recognize the significance of identity and feeling recognized, accepted, and affirmed to overall health and well-being? So we want to be cautious of this sort of um, illness and deficit based focus. <clears throat> And the adoption of population health and social determinants of health perspective in public health has reflected an attempt to shift our attention towards social and cultural environments as explanations for health outcomes. And Canada has been a world leader in public health and actually developing the population health approach. Um, 
So, but despite this recognition that there are social and structural determinants of health and that not everything can be boiled down to individual health behaviors, what we tend to see is that our actual health promotion strategies and interventions do often still focus on the individual and on individual responsibility for health behaviors. So although we recognize in theory that population health disparities are structural in nature, um, you know, let's make sure this is actually reflected in how we intervene. <clears throat> so um, some patterns that we want to think about and kind of avoid are, universalizing or making broad generalizations about populations. Um, this might look like relying on assumptions about um, folks' behaviors or vulnerability uh, based on just belonging to a certain population. <clears throat> and we also wanna be aware of individualizing or putting too much emphasis on individual behaviors or lifestyle as, a responsive for, as responsible for health outcomes. Uh, because really when we assume that the risk to health or protection from illness is really just a result of individual choices. And the individual is the one who has to undergo interventions to improve a health issue rather than looking at a more um, you know, social and structural context. We are erasing the social processes that produce oppression and inequity. And this is just such an important context for, for health and healthcare. So this brings us to our next point. <clears throat> that our efforts to advance health equity should really be recognizing diversity within LGBTQ2S plus communities. So intersectional analysis uh, views social markers like race, gender identity, sexual orientation, social class, uh, disability as products of social systems rather than actually just individual attributes. And it looks at how these overlap both in social systems and actually in the lives of individuals. And so we can credit this concept of intersectionality to civil rights advocate and legal scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw Williams, who coined the term to highlight that discrimination laws didn't adequately recognize how black women's experiences of sexism and racism overlap and intersect. So within the re legal realm, feminist theory had not really expanded to, to race nor had anti-racist policies really captured the impacts of sexism. Uh, so thinking about this kind of concept of intersectionality, Similarly, stigma and discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity um, intersects with discrimination on the basis of other socially constructed categories um, like race, like gender, like ability, which uniquely shapes a person's experiences and health. And conventional population health research and policy don't tend to address this complexity of discrimination or its health effects. So it's also important that we recognize that these social markers of difference such as race, gender, sexual orientation, are, step, uh, are not simply separate and additive building blocks of inequality. But as we move through life, the social identities that we do hold uh, give us all both power and opportunities in some areas and restrict our power and opportunities in others. So really health disparities are best understood as a result of intersecting forces and using this sort of critical anti-oppression framework. And uh, you know, we want our research policy and programs to uh, begin addressing the intersections of race, ethnicity, gender, class, sexuality, age, rural, urban residents, disability, and other markers of social difference. <clears throat> uh, so to kind of sum up um, this, this conversation uh, before moving into to our panel today, uh, the continuum displayed on this slide can help us to understand these potential uh, limitations of our approaches in public health and map out uh, where we've been, where we're at, and where we want to go. Um, and this visual is adapted from a paper that kind of uh, covers these, um, these discourses in, in greater detail. And it's great for the reading for those who are kind of uh, interested in, in theory and some of the things that we've touched on so far. Um, but basically moving from less helpful uh, approaches from the left uh, to more helpful approaches to the right, you could think about where you might situate uh, your work. And this is a continuum, so the points aren't distinct. And you might recognize, um, you might recognize uh, several of these discourses kind of operating at once. Um, so just to link this back to what we've been discussing so far, um, multicultural or diversity discourses are those that might not actually explicitly uh, recognize or include LGBTQ2S plus uh, communities at all. And this is also where we can see population health issues understood more as individual lifestyle, behavior, or choices. Uh, but as we move towards the right side of the continuum, 
we really begin placing greater emphasis on structural conditions that influence health and well-being, and we begin applying a more intersectional analysis to our interventions. And we recognize that shifting power through structural transformation is actually really necessary to enhance uh, quality and access of health services for diverse LGBTQ2S plus communities. Um, so ultimately, this work is called for to ensure that the rights of queer and trans people in our communities are upheld. So we present this continuum uh, to get you thinking about what communities or populations are implied in your organization's access and equity initiatives and which communities or populations uh, are not implied currently and what organizational or contextual factors actually contribute to uh, inclusion or exclusion of particular communities. Um, so leaving you with some of those questions to kind of ponder on, uh, we're now really excited to bring you three incredible speakers to help us consider how our organizations can work towards meaningful gains in meeting the needs of diverse LGBTQ2S plus communities. So today we're going to hear from Jay Fiedler, Yoshi Pereira, and Becky Van Tassel. Jay Fiedler is a social worker and sexuality educator from Detroit, Michigan. They have a background in HIV case management, bicycle mechanics, and facilitating conversations around gender and sexual identities. They've been facilitating workshops on sexuality as part of the team at the Sexuality Education Resource Center in Manitoba since they immigrated to a different part of Anishinaabe territory in 2016. Yoshi, who uses, uses he, him pronouns, identifies as a queer South Asian settler on this land and is a healthcare disruptor at heart. Equipped with a formal education in public health and clinical medicine, and currently working towards a master's in health design with OCAD University, he has navigated a variety of experiences supporting health communications, primary health care delivery, and community health promotion programs. His experiences are shaped by the importance of centering community voices and working with communities to support health equity gains. And Becky Van Tassel, who uses she, her pronouns, has been employed in the nonprofit sector since 2001. She holds a Bachelor of Social Work and a Master's of Adult Education, specializing in educational research. Her work has primarily focused on sexuality, inclusion, sexual health, and healthy relationships. Becky is a training center manager and community engagement manager at the Center for Sexuality in Calgary, Alberta. So thank you all for coming together today to share your experience and perspectives. And we're really grateful for the opportunity to learn from you. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to you now, Jay. Sweet. Hi, everybody. I am stalling as I share my slides. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. Hello. Uh, so getting into things, uh, I am also going to continue setting the stage uh, a little bit and then getting over to Yoshi and Becky, who are really going to kind of share with what we can do with all of this information. And so for my, my piece, I really just want to focus on with this diagram I'm showing you, I think a lot of times in this work, we look at those individual and relational pieces that um, we can do to be better. So that's maybe the way we talk to patients or clients or within coworkers and those kinds of things, um, which are all great things. But I also want to take a look at that institutional circle you see there. So while you're certainly an individual, with experiences, values, beliefs, all of those things, when you show up to work, uh, you're kind of representing the institution of healthcare. And so with that bigger circle, we see there's kind of a bigger, um, a larger realm of influence um, working with individuals, whether that's patients or clients. And so I want to look in that, I want to look at some current event stuff. I want to look at some past things specifically in Canada but they could be applicable. I think there's a few folks on here from the US as well. So we're gonna do a little true and false game. So hopefully um, hopefully people aren't getting like flashbacks from school. Uh, so for this activity, uh, at the top of your screen, there should be a view options. And if you click on that, uh, you should be able to have that annotate function that you will see. And so if you click on that, you will get that menu bar that I'm showing you. And if you want to go and select a stamp, clicking on that, uh, and then if folks want to try it out, just clicking on the screen, there should be just a bunch of stamps. Okay, someone's got some check marks showing up. Cool. At least, okay, more stuff. Now we got hearts. So yeah, you can pick any of those stamps you want. 
And then on the next slide in a moment, at the top it'll say true or false. I'll be reading some statements and you can annotate, guess true or false. And if you don't know, you know, click somewhere in between. Uh, you also don't have to participate. That's okay as well. Um, but this way we can make it a little bit interactive. So I'm going to pull up my annotate function. Okay. All right. So the first statement that we're going to talk about, true or false, you can guess uh, up at the top there. Um, men who have sex with men are ineligible from donating blood for one year after their last same-sex experience. True or false? What do you think? Oh, someone's not having the annotate function. I think also for folks that um, may be using like a tablet or phone, sometimes I know the annotate function doesn't work. So that could be a piece. It's okay, you can play along at home. <laughs> um, that way um, also as well, if you're not sure, I'm not, I'm not grading it basically is the other piece. Okay, so I see some people in the chat box are saying they don't have the annotate function. This would be a fun technical like Zoom thing. That's okay. We can still go through this. Uh, you can still uh, play at home. And for the folks that are able to do it, we'll do it. I'm, I'm going to give you the answers anyway. <laughs> um, so for this first one, I'll, I'll give you the answer if people figure out the annotation function as we go, that's okay. Um, so for this first one, this is false. So in Canada here, uh, the, actually this changed last year. So previously, I don't know all of the years, um, but there was a, a deferral or actual complete ban uh, for blood donation on men who have sex with men that changed to a five-year deferral period. Uh, then it changed to one year, uh, and then last year in 2019, that changed to a three-month deferral period. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, uh, but let's try the next one. We'll see if anyone has that annotation function working. So for this next one, conversion therapy is legal in Canada. Maybe folks still aren't able to annotate, that's okay. I'll pause for a moment as people think about that. <clears throat> Jay, if you wanna quickly check um, under, if you click more settings for you, yeah. and next to the one that said um, show or hide names, there may be another setting that says enable or disable participants from annotating. Yeah. Oh. It says disable, so I just click that and I'll, I'll allow again. Okay. So maybe that, yeah, maybe that'll work. <laughs> I, I turned Sorry. it off and I turned it back Sorry. on. If we don't get it going, uh, trying to figure out. It's okay. It's computer stuff. Sometimes you just turn it off and turn it back on. Um, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It is what it is. Um, so if folks want to try the annotate function again, I did turn it off and turn it on on, on my end. So that might have been a hiccup. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, what else? Okay, so for this one, without further ado, for folks that, um, okay, so some folks are saying still not available. So for folks that might not be familiar with conversion therapy, this one is true-ish, which I have. Uh, it's legal in Canada, though there are some places that have uh, a ban or restrictions or it's discouraged. So there's that long list of provinces and like cities and towns that have passed different um, like either laws or resolutions around converted therapy. And so these two statements are both current. So right now, um, uh, if you think about um, like men who have sex with men, that kind of as uh, Laura was talking about earlier about the broad generalizations, that does kind of talk kind of about behavior, um, but it doesn't uh, talk about uh, really like specifically what kind of sex, but really it looks at a identity and then really kind of stigmatizes someone's blood, right? Uh, there are also other deferral periods. If you get a tattoo, uh, when I gave blood, it asked me if I exchanged 
sex for money, if I've been to certain countries, if I'm from certain countries. So there's many deferral periods looking at many different kinds of folks. But this one uh, definitely impacts gay men, bisexual men. Uh, and then conversion therapy, for those that aren't familiar, it's a, a practice of really trying to really pray the gay way is one way it's called. Uh, and research has shown that this uh, it's really not helpful. It's rather damaging for folks. And also currently there's a law that's looking at uh, a bill to change that federally here in Canada. All right, let's do a few more without the annotation function. That's okay. Uh, true or false? Canada used to have a death penalty for those convicted of sodomy. Oh, Keith says false. I love using the chat box for, to, to answer. That's totally great. Thanks. Thanks for playing along, Keith. I appreciate it. Um, so this one is true. Uh, so uh, I'm from the United States, so I think it's taken me a minute. Confederation, I think, was 1867, I think. So there was the really only a, a few years, and there was no one was put to death as far as the historical record uh, says. However, uh, it, people could go to jail for like life for long periods of time. And that didn't really change. Only partial or decriminalization came in 1969, so another 100 years later. All right, next one. The American Psychiatric Association diagnosed homosexuality as a mental illness until 1973. Okay, oh, more people are playing along in the, the chat box. Carrie says true. <laughs> so this one, Carrie is correct. Uh, it is true. So for these two, again, I, I um, going back to that Laura's comment about those, those broad generalizations, um, I often say in workshops, who can have anal sex, which is, what sodomy is referring to. Most of the time, sodomy is legally referred to various things, but pretty much anyone that has an anus and consents. <laughs> uh, however, that uh, fact up top was really uh, aimed at men. Um, also at that time, right, like legally women weren't people, <laughs> unfortunately. So how that, like, how that law um, targeted folks was really more about identity. Uh, it wasn't necessarily about a certain behavior. Uh, and th uh, the second one, if we look at how, you know, partial decriminalization happened in Canada in 1969 uh, until 1973, that was still considered a mental illness, even though it was decriminalized. Uh, and furthermore, to kind of also repeat some things uh, Laura mentioned. This change that happened in 1973 was from uh, queer activists pushing for change, going to the American Psychiatric Association's annual conferences uh, and pushing these issues along with some allies that were um, within the association as well. Okay, a few more. I think we got four more. Uh, so currently it is legal for doctors to perform Normalization, that's not a legal word, uh, but normalization surgeries on the genitals of an intersex infant. True or false? Currently, carries this true. All right. So this one uh, is true with parental consent. Um, so often that's kind of coerced, the parental consent. For those of you that maybe our parents have given birth or gone through that experience, um, you know, that can be, there can be so many things happening in that situation. So if a doctor comes and says, this is something we need to do, um, you know, it, it can be hard to um, get fully informed decisions when you're worrying about uh, a newborn. Uh, and so when I put like quote unquote normalization surgeries, these are kind of what are deemed like non-medically necessary just to like quote unquote, normalized genitals. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a moment. Let's do this other one. 
The Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, found that two-spirit children were particularly vulnerable to violence and abuse in residential schools. Keith put true in all caps. Keith feels strongly about that one or maybe confident about the answer. Yeah, so this one uh, is true. Um, so there was a specific two-day hearing for Two-Spirit survivors uh, during um, when the Truth and Reconciliation Committee was doing hearings around this. Uh, and so for this one also within the report, there's, I think it's one paragraph. I don't know exactly for sure really about uh, Two-Spirit people. And there's been a lot of Two-Spirit activism uh, asking for an expansion on that and for more of a report talking about Two-Spirit people. And also folks that maybe have seen the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls and Two-Spirited People report that came out, I think that, I think that was last year. And um, the, the inclusion of talking about Two-Spirit experiences in that uh, was kind of, in my opinion, what I saw as like a step forward really to include that. Uh, and furthermore, I just wanted to add to about the, the intersex issues is I know in the United States, I saw in the news, I believe in the past year, it was um, Boston and Chicago. There are two hospitals uh, that have now um, changed their policy to stop doing some of the procedures that are being referred to um, up here. All right. All right, two more, and then I'll pass it on to, to Yoshi to kind of say, what are we going to do with this as we move on? Um, so sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression are protected classes in Canadian human rights legislation. He says, true with a question mark. Jerry says false with a question mark. Okay, so some people aren't as sure about this one. So this is a little bigger. Uh, it is true. So sexual orientation was added in 1996. So again, if we think about like de partial decriminalization criminalization in 1969, um, this was you know definitely many years later. Uh, and gender identity expression was added fairly recently, just in 2017. Uh, all right. Last one, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, the Canadian military ended its ban on homosexuality uh, when, B, when Bill C-5 was passed in 1992. Again, specific. I know true and false is hard. Anytime I talk about history, I don't remember years as well, so. Carrie says, true question mark. I made this last one hard. Part of the statement is, is, uh, is true. This one's false. So uh, the Canadian military ended uh, a ban in 1992, that year is correct. However, that change actually came from a lawsuit that was filed by uh, Michelle Douglas, who was a high ranking officer in the military and she lost her job due to that ban. Oddly enough, I was reading about this recently. Yoshi actually sent me some information on it uh, that uh, she was on the unit that actually was like looking for uh, homosexuals within the military and, and getting them fired, oddly enough. So uh, interesting story, worth looking up more. However, I know I went through these things very quickly, a lot of different information, both currently uh, and historically. However, some of these things like looking at the blood ban, looking at conversion therapy, uh, looking at criminalization and medicalization, uh, patho, patho, I always say this wrong, pathologizing, pathologizing, I can say that word, patho, pathologizing, I can't. you know the word I'm trying to say, um, really identity, right, for 2ST LGBTQ folks. Many of these things are very recent or current. And so these are things to keep in mind when you know whether you've got that rainbow sticker like kind of on your office whatever it is um, folks coming in to receive health care as an institution these are some of the pieces that really you kind of inherit um, being a health care provider uh, and so these are things that 
we don't always have to keep all of these things in mind. Uh, we're not going to know all of the pieces of history. Uh, your patients or clients might know not, not know all of these pieces of history. However, uh, they do impact each other. They do impact us, whether we know these things or not. And even looking through some of these statements, uh, we can see where there was a death penalty for, for sodomy. Um, then there was homosexuality was considered a mental illness. There's bans in the military. There's all of these pieces, uh, the blood ban currently. I, I kind of think some of these things are, are tied together, right? <clears throat> and whether they know it or not. And, and also, again, kind of going back to some of those things Laura said, some of these things were changed not just because of a, a law changing, they were done uh, from the queer community pushing for change and asking for change. And so that's kind of why I wanted to include this last one, showing that it wasn't even a bill that was passed despite um, you know, decriminalization happening and other efforts happening. It really took uh, someone to step forward and take a lawsuit uh, to get some of the changes happening and how that can really take years and work uh, be a lot of emotional labor from folks to make these things happen. So thinking of all of this stuff, which is quite a bit, um, I'm going to now pass it over to Yoshi, who's going to begin to talk about what are some of the things we can do with all of this and, and step forward to make change in our work. Thanks so much, uh, Jay, for um, for that um, for setting that historical context and um, for sharing some important milestones in, in within the Canadian context. Um, so, hi everybody. My name is uh, Yosh. I go by he him pronouns. Um, I identify as um, a South Asian settler on this land. Um, I'm connecting to you all from the territories of the Anishinaabek. Huron Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And I apologize because my phone's going off the going off the rails, and I haven't really put it on silent, which I will do right now. Um, there you go. Um, and um, also, uh, I, I just want to preface that you know, two S LGBTQ plus communities um, are not a monolith. Um, Hence, I'm not, I'm only, I'm speaking from a very specific social location um, that is based off of my own lived experience. Um, therefore, my co comments shouldn't necessarily be taken as, um, as, uh, as sort of like that answer to all questions. I do not have the answers to all the questions. And I, I definitely would suggest that you reach out to your local to SLGBTQ plus communities and community champions in order to ensure that the work that you do is centered around their their um, needs and their experiences. Um, I'd like to start by uh, sharing um, this quote that I really, really appreciate by Marcia J. Anderson. Um, it was such a privilege to actually hear from them um, at the CPHA conference that happened a couple of weeks ago as well. Uh, they are a Cree Anishinaabe doctor from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, and you know, if you actually go to her Twitter platform, she says, uh, from now on, instead of vulnerable people, I'm going to use the phrase people we oppress through policy choices and discourses of racial inferiority. It's, it's a bit longer, but I think will help us focus on where the problems actually lie health equity and indigenous peoples. Um, this same context is, is, is very much true within, within the context of queer and trans health as well. So my objectives today are really to give a little bit of um, context around two projects um, from Moyo Health and Community Services that we lead. One is the 2SLGBTQ plus collaborative project that I oversee, as well as some um, specific reflections and learnings based off of some queer and trans um, uh, trainings that we offer through the organization. So the 2SLGBTQ plus collaborative of Peel region, um, we, uh, we are 
uh, a collaborative project, a systems level change project. It is funded by the local um, region of Peel. Uh, we have 13 organizations on our collaborative and the objective of all of us coming together was to develop our collective as well as our individual agency capacities to better serve queer and trans folks within the region. The, um, in terms of some of the outputs of this specific project, we have a leadership table, which is comprised of members of leadership within the respective organizations. We meet about every two months to discuss high level priorities within the project. We also have a service provision network uh, table, and that meets about every three months. And the objective of that is to connect with 2SLGBTQ plus service providers in the region, um, as well as um, folks doing queer and trans work within the region um, in order to create a safer space for meaningful conversations and capacity building. We also have an annual forum um, called Adjust Your Lens, and we have a virtual platform called um, Rainbow Salad. So if you check out www.rainbowsalad.ca, um, you should be able to access that platform as well. So this is a collaborative project. Um, what as a collaborative we did was we recognized the fact that, you know, there's a lot more work to be done collectively um, in order to make sure that we are offering safer spaces for folks um, who identify as to as LGBTQ plus um, to access services. Um, and one of the requirements in, in becoming a member of this collaborative project was that we asked folks if they had done some kind of organizational audit, a formal audit of their organizations to see if they have reflected intentionally on, on the agency's capacity to offer queer and trans services, uh, competent services. So we developed a bit of an audit. It, it comprised of about 33 questions. It took about roughly 10 minutes to complete. And um, if agencies had not done um, any kind of audit like this, we would provide support in order to complete an audit. All staff, volunteers, members of the board would complete this audit um, that would be supported by a member of our team. Um, we, we intentionally prefaced the fact that, you know, um, we're all um, in a place of progress. We're all learning and, and unlearning constantly so that folks don't feel uncomfortable um, sharing their discomfort um, with, you know, supporting a queer and trans client, for example. Um, and when they're not sure, they could be um, very, uh, they, they could feel confident and comfortable enough to say, yeah, I'm not quite sure about, you know, providing supports in this way. Um, I'd like to share this quote by, by Colin Duran, the Executive Director of Pride at Work Canada, which I took from the Beyond Diversity um, Toolkit that's accessible online. The progress we have seen in the last few decades is astonishing but we need to continue to work together to build a bright future for LGBTQ people. For each of us who breaks a barrier or cracks the ceiling, there's someone else who needs a helping hand. And I think when I reflect on this quote, one of the things that comes to mind for me is there was a generation that fought for the rights of queer and trans folks. And this very generation is also the generation that is now um, having barriers to accessing um, older adult services and senior services when it comes to queer and trans specific um, programs and services. Because often, and for me specifically, when I think about a specific instance where I was working with a service provider who was, um, who was gearing their services for older adults and seniors, one of, one of their reflections was, well, none of our seniors or older adults actually identify as queer and trans. Well, if they're not identifying as queer and trans, it's often a reflective of, you know, their comfort, their own level of safety, whether they feel like they have the ability to come out in a safer way. So just uh, just a quick reflection there I wanted to ask. So um, what, what I wanted to do was, um, I know our annotate function may not be working. Um, I'm just gonna double check from my end to make sure that that's possible. Um, but I wanted to share a couple of statements um, 
that we use um, within uh, our organizational audit. And um, we, ask, we ask folks to, uh, you know, reflect on whether these are some practices or strategies that they use within their work. Um, an example of a question was, I review forms, posters, and resources monthly for 2SLGBTQ plus inclusivity and appropriate language. So what I'm going to ask you folks to do is do a little bit of a reflective exercise. Unfortunately, I'm not looking at the chat at the same time. It's not really letting me do that, um, possibly because I just have one screen up. Um, but if you folks can reflect on it, write it down on a piece of paper as we go along. I have four example statements. Or um, if you wish to use the annotate function, please, please go ahead. Um, the second statement that I'd like to share is, I feel confident working with clients and communities of all sexualities and genders. So within that spectrum, where, where would you see yourself be? Would you say that you are not, not at all confident, somewhat confident, confident, very confident, or extremely confident? Um, And then another statement, I understand how homophobia, transphobia, and or heterosexism relates and intersects with other oppressions such as racism and sexism. So going back to, um, going back to what Laura mentioned a little bit earlier um, about intersectionality, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, what um, she emphasized the fact that, you know, we, we have those intersectional identities that, you know, the post-structuralist theory of recognizing the fact that, you know, it, it, you cannot just go by a categorical binary view of the experiences of folks. Um, and then the final statement I'd like to share with folks that is also a part of our audit tool is um, we ask folks to reflect on, um, you know, I know how to report an act of prejudice or discrimination on the basis of gender and or sexuality at my workplace. So what, what happens is, you know, folks, um, when we administer this audit tool to, uh, to a specific organization, it is shared, as I said, with the frontline, or, uh, frontline workers, with the administrative staff, with the volunteers, with, uh, uh, with members of the board, um, it's shared with everybody. And then, you know, often we don't get 100% of folks participating, but hopefully if you're lucky, we get about 75%, 50 to 75%. Um, and then based on the data that is collected, um, myself and the team, we write a bit of a, a one or two page report based on our own reflections of, of the themes that emerge. And we have some conversations with the leadership of the organization to say, you know, these are some potential strategies or next steps that we can take to try and address some of these inequities that we can clearly see um, uh, that might be propagated within, within the organization. trying to move to the next slide. There we go. So, uh, so some of these strategies are actually learning opportunities. So we at Moyo Health and Community Services, we developed a couple of training opportunities. We developed, a, uh, we developed four tiers of trainings, um, a basic elementary training that looked at terminology and history. Um, a beginner training that then took a little bit of a step up and, and started talking about power and privilege, and then an intermediate training that looked around that looked at allyship, uh, specifically allyship internally within an organization among peers, among colleagues, as well as allyship with um, with clients that individuals would be serving. And um, and then we also developed a right to be out program training that looked specifically at scenarios 
um, or cases that we engaged members of members of the leadership team at these respective organizations. And it would be a one full day of training where we have meaningful discussions on how to make a workplace safer um, for not just the clients, but also um, the staff within an organization. On the right hand side, you, you can see um, Bloom's taxonomy. And, you know, when we looked at these trainings that we had developed, one of our reflections was that, you know, they aligned mainly with the lower tiers, um, looking at knowledge and comprehensiveness. Um, and we, despite um, the feedback that we had received from the trainings, you know, we realized that we needed to create a lot more opportunities for folks to take an intersectional lens to supporting their clients. So what we decided to do was we started developing cases uh, with, with members of our communities. So when we came across perhaps um, some kind of client feedback or a client story that referred to some challenges that they were experiencing in accessing services, we worked with them to explore a form of learning that could be then used in those respective organizations. Okay. So um, so this is a little bit of um, the, so I just want to also state that, you know, when we did over the last three years, we've trained over 1500 service providers um, using these trainings. Um, although we had trained over 1500 folks, um, we only about 500, roughly 534 individuals um, participated in the evaluation because some of the organizations that we worked with did not feel comfortable enough um, to administer pre and post evaluations. I think, you know, that itself um, can sometimes be reflective of a certain amount of discomfort or acknowledgement of the fact that organizations require to embark on a journey of change. Um, not being able to or not feeling comfortable enough for uh, for evaluation to take place around how your um, frontline workers or how your organization is looking at career and trans inclusion if you have discomfort with that i think that that is also quite telling of uh, of the culture or what you might identify within the culture of an organization so we did ultimately have the ability to evaluate about 534 folks and when we evaluated folks, we, um, we did a pre and post evaluation and we did a six month evaluation. When we looked at the pre and post evaluation, um, we looked at three specific areas. We looked at the communication skills to discuss sexuality with, uh, among service providers. We looked at the ability of service providers to connect clients to appropriate services. And we looked at the ability of service providers to change their practice to make services more accessible to priority, priority groups. So when we looked at um, these three specific areas, pre and post, uh, we then you know, took the average of those results and then we looked at the change in capacity. And um, that was uh, what we used to, um, uh, used to evaluate the impact of our trainings on service providers uh, and services. This is an example of a question that was used in the pre and post evaluation. So how much do you know about 2SLGBTQ plus terminology, language and concepts? Um, so the pre is in blue and the post is in orange. So you see um, the median has shifted a little bit. Um, the surveys um, that were administered were using a five point Likert scale. Uh, this is another question that we asked, you know, how confident do you feel about dealing with or referring to SLGBTQ plus individuals to a counselor or health service or community service? And in asking um, some of these questions and then following up with some more open-ended questions, we also identified that, you know, often folks just don't know what they don't know. So um, the training offered an opportunity for, for, our, for the folks who had attended our trainings to really explore what that meant. Um, one of the other reflections um, was also 
uh, when we asked folks, why do you not know what you don't know? <laughs> so that's a, that's kind of taking uh, it a bit step further, right? Uh, which could also be reflective of organizational culture. Um, and and who are the who, what are those uh, who are those priority communities that you are um, historically engaging with and continue to engage with? So, based on um, the evaluation um, of of these uh, evaluation that was administered. Um, one of a couple of statements that we asked folks was, um, you know, we asked them to think about whether they visibly uh, use inclusive signage on their website or promotional material, whether they have uh, inclusive washrooms in their place of business, whether they refer someone to a community service um, before they do this, whether they research and verify whether that service is to us LGBTQ plus inclusive or meet a certain standard of experience, knowledge, and friendliness. So in these three statements, you know, 30, 32 to 33% of, um, of the folks that um, participated in the evaluation um, said yes. And then when you look at a statement like we do uh, staff mandatory education on anti-oppression and how to become more inclusive service providers, we saw roughly about 59% actually uh, um, do that training. So 59% of 534 folks actually have mandatory training on anti-oppression. But when I reflect on the other three statements, I think there is a little bit of a disconnect in operationalizing this anti-oppression um, education into practice, right? Um, and we often see this as well, you know, you have organizations are often have one training during pride and, and that's often, that, that's all that happens. Our six month evaluation, what we do is we have, um, I specifically have one-on-one -on -one interviews with an organizational representative and we have conversations about um, what kind of uh, changes um, that uh, are happening at the organization as a result of the training? Are they looking at a full policy review? Are they um, looking at structural changes within the organization, such as washrooms, um, artwork that is reflective of diverse BIPOC, queer and trans um, communities, et cetera? So one last um, um, qualitative comment that I'd like to share based on um, the feedback that we've received. Um, one. Um, one participant shared, sometime after the training in the lunchroom, I connected with a colleague who said, thanks for organizing it. I didn't know what I didn't know. When our counterpart agencies in other regions reached out to ask what we did for Pride, we were so happy to say we already did trainings at all our sites. Our comms team did a newsletter too regarding the training and need to change culture is hard to quantify. So that was a reflection based on one of those one-on-one -on -one interviews. And I just want to reiterate the fact that, you know, no knowledge product, not this webinar, not, not a newsletter, not um, um, a term sheet um, can be, uh, can replace um, your, your, your commitment to develop a strategy to staying informed, right? So what are those Twitter accounts that you're following? What is the media you're listening to? You really need to come up with a strategy rather than just having one tool that you can look to um, throughout the year or throughout your career. And um, I'll end off before I pass it over to Becky. Um, this is something that really sits with me well um, when we talk about communities that are marginalized by our systems and structures. When you debate a person about something that affects them more than it affects you, remember that it will take a much greater emotional toll on them than you. For you, it may feel like an academic exercise. For them, it feels like revealing their pain only to have you dismiss their experience and sometimes their humanity. The fact that you might remain more calm under these circumstances is a consequence of your privilege, not increased objectivity on your part. So it's important that we all stay humble as service providers. Um, now I'll kind of um, hand it off to Becky to lead us um, in the next part of the presentation. 
Hi, everybody. Um, you might want to just stand up and take a little stretch uh, while Laura takes over and switches onto our other um, PowerPoint slides for you. So my name is Becky Van Tassel. I use she, her pronouns, and I work at the Center for Sexuality in Calgary, Alberta, uh, which is located on Treaty 7. So um, I really do feel super grateful to have followed uh, both uh, Yash and Jay um, because I think that they just spoke so eloquently about so many of the things that are really important to this. Um, something that Yash brought up that I brought up that I think is super relevant is we're all learning and we're all changing and we're all adapting. Um, and it's really important that we come to this work with a sense of curiosity and uh, really kind of being open to what we don't know. So for those of you who have never heard of the Center for Sexuality, uh, we really focus on teaching, training, and advocating to support healthy bodies, healthy relationships, and healthy communities. And our widespread vision is the sexual well-being for all. So Laura, I'm going to ask you to move my slides, um, and I'll just kind of give you a little indication. So I'm going to talk about a four-year project in 10 minutes. So I apologize if I speak very quickly. Uh, this is being reported, so you can definitely check it out later. Um, so the Center for Sexuality has actually provided uh, LGBTQ 2S plus training uh, to health and social ser service providers since 2009. And in that time, we've seen over 30,000 uh, health and social service providers. What we started to recognize probably in about 2015 was that we were going back and seeing the same organizations time after time. And things weren't, things weren't changing. Levels of knowledge might be improving, but policies and practices remained relatively consistent. And so we started to think about what needs to happen for true sustainable change and inclusion to occur. And we recognize that it's a fairly complicated um, process that involves not only excellent policy, practice, and procedure, but staff capacity building to support that. So we would often go in and work with service providers and they would say, yeah, I totally get it, but our policy actually doesn't support that. Or on the other hand, we would speak to administration who would say, we have these great policies, but staff are uncomfortable using them. And so that is really what led to our project in 2016. Um, so we received a grant from the Calgary Homeless Foundation specifically to look at improving inclusion for LGBTQ 2S plus youth in the homeless sector. And from that, we did an incredibly extensive literature review where we started by saying, what does inclusion mean? And what is the difference between diversity versus inclusion? Uh, based on that, we uh, created a extremely long audit tool, uh, which has four sectors sections to it. So our sections are creating a welcoming environment, service delivery and practice, community engagement, and um, organizational development. So our, or, our audit practice actually takes uh, four to six hours to complete, and it's a facilitated process. Based on the pilots, we actually have created several audits that are specific to um, various populations. So we do have one for long-term care. Uh, we do have one specific to youth, we have one for a corporate audience, and then we have sort of a generalized audit, which can be um, offered in many different agencies. We also did recognize that while capacity building has literally been um, what we've done as an agency since 1974, uh, that, that looking at organizational change and development work is really going to push the needle on inclusion. And so our whole service has actually started really focusing on this much more. Do you want to change the slide, Laura? Great. So we were going to use annotate, surprise, surprise. Um, obviously, we are not going to do that. But I want us to think about change. So a change that you've experienced in your own organization. Um, and we're going to use the chat box. So I want you to um, type out, just so that everybody can see, a change that occurred that was good. And why was it good? So if you can think about a positive change and use one or two words to describe it, that would be really great.
And I have all of these things on the side to kind of help you think about it. So because I'm quite short on time, what I will do, great, it incorporated feedback, thank you. I'm gonna move on and just keep an eye on the chat. Um, really what we found out from our review of the literature is that change is going to be most successful if it's well communicated, if it's super clear, and if it involves um, all sort of parts of the agency. So it's working with administration, but we're also working with the staff directly. Um, so Kirk says a standard email signature template now specifically includes pronouns. This normalizes it for all staff and creates an environment where we recognize that gender shouldn't be assumed. Great. And so I think that's a really good change to talk about. I'm sure when that happened, there had to be communication. You had to explain the rationale for the change. It was clear. And so for our change process, we really look at how can we make sure that the change is not um, forced on folks. And so to do this, we created a pretty robust change process. Laura, do you wanna skip slides? So one of the pieces that I think is really important that we touch on is conscious change leadership. And it really is being consciously aware that you're aware and being aware of what fills your awareness. So being super present in everything that you do. Um, and as an agency, we have, um, we've existed for a very long time and we actually had to become quite aware of our own internal um, practices. And so we ourselves took the audit and we didn't score as high as one would expect. And I think it's really important to, to share that because we're always trying to move the needle and to improve. And so what I wanna see in our audit is actually lower scores as opposed to higher scores. Do you wanna to go to the next one? So when we look at organizational change and if any of you are gonna leave here today thinking, I really need to do more to create a more inclusive workspace, um, you actually wanna focus on three different areas. So you wanna look at the content, the process and the people. These are the different pillars that you need to attend, attend to as you roll out any kind of change. Next one. So for our people, um, this is really acknowledging that when a change occurs, there's a psychological response to that change. And so sometimes when we've um, done this, people have said things like, well, why are we focusing so much attention on LGBTQ2 plus identities? Uh, what does that mean for me? And rather than getting defensive, we're able to really work with that person to identify um, what's going on for them internally, psychologically, what kind of mechanisms are coming up. And it's important that we sort of normalize change. And we also normalize that it's going to actually benefit everyone. Uh, the next part, uh, Laura, if you can move on, is content. And so this is like really the meat uh, and potatoes, if you will. So we're looking at structures, systems, business processes, all of it. So what are all of the different mechanisms that we have to address in order to create a more inclusive workplace? Next one. And lastly, this is the how. So how are we going to communicate it? Who is involved? What is the timeline? Um, when we started doing this process, we thought that we would work with organizations for a period of one year. And what we've actually learned is that true organizational change and development takes five years. So well, we'll work very intensely with an organization for the first year and build capacity of their internal stakeholders and agents of change. Uh, the reality is, is we're going to be kind of working in partnership with them in the long term. Next slide, Laura. So in two minutes, I'm gonna go over our organizational change framework very quickly and then I want us to have a lot of time for questions. So I'll stop my presentation at that point. So the first thing that we do with an organization and, and both of the other speakers today spoke about this, uh, we really do help the organization create the case for change. So why are we doing this? What is the benefit? Um, how is this gonna improve service delivery for all humans that are accessing their services? The second part is setting the stage. So this is when we um, start to identify who are the internal um, kind of key champions that we're going to be working with. How are we gonna communicate this process to the staff? Uh, how are we gonna let them know why we're sending out so many uh, evaluations and assessments? And really that's because we want to 
measure change of the, of the cultural climate. So we do a lot of pre-test surveys and post-test surveys to see if folks actually do feel safer. If there is a decrease in uh, heterosexism and homophobia present in, in the language and behaviors in trans, uh, transphobia as well. Then we go in and we do our internal assessment, which is a 500 scale point audit. And like I said, that does occur um, over four to six hours. We also do an environmental assessment where we'll walk through and we'll spend quite a bit of time reviewing policy manuals. Then we work with the team to set some goals around how do you want this to roll out? How do you want this to happen? Uh, next slide, Laura. Following that, we do a really great and clear implementation plan. Then we get into the methods of how that's going to happen and we start working with the organization to go through their audit process to build capacity to make changes and to improve policy and then finally we do the evaluation. And then most of the work is actually is in the sustaining place. Um, so we work very hard with the organizations to make sure that these changes continue that when new staff are onboarded they understand why this is important they're practicing in ways that's really very inclusive um, and is going to uh, help the agency continue to meet their goals of inclusion okay next slide laura so if you want more information about this please check out our website or email me that was quite fast and furious um, but I'm going to turn it back over to Laura right now, who's going to share some resources with you. And then we're going to move into the question portion of this. So thank you all. Okay, I uh, just want to say before we jump into the questions, thank you so much to all of you, Jay and Yosh and Becky, uh, for really an engaging and thought provoking conversation. I'm sure there should be lots of questions from our uh, audience members. And we do have about uh, 15 minutes left for questions. Um, so I encourage folks, if you have questions, uh, you can use the Q&A um, button. It should be, uh, I believe it displays at the bottom of your screen with two little um, conversation bubbles and Q&A. Um, and then we'll be able to take a look at uh, the questions that come through. <clears throat> and uh, just uh, before, while we're waiting for those questions to roll in, and as Becky uh, has just um, kind of alluded to, we did also um, for this webinar put together um, a list of resources uh, that we're going to share with folks. Um, it's going to be sent uh, in the follow-up email from, from today's webinar with the, with the webinar slides as well as um, the recording. Um, what we've done is put together um, a list of organizations that, you know, that we're aware of and it's by no means exhaustive, but some of the organizations that we're aware of that are doing um, similar work uh, to really work with organizations in the health and social service sector uh, to work on building uh, capacity at the organizational level for LGBTQ2S plus inclusion. Um, so if you're looking for folks in your region uh, who might be doing similar, uh, similar work, that's a resource for you. And, and we really do encourage you to find out, because this, our list is definitely not exhaustive, uh, get to know who in your community uh, is, is doing this work and, and you know, start creating those partnerships if, if they aren't already there, um, as our speakers have really, uh, um, you know, kind of, um, driven the point is that it's it's so much about this sustained uh, and ongoing uh, process and, and those partnerships are really important to that. Um, so uh, with that, I see there is a question that's come through. So I'll pose this uh, to the group. Um, what are some effective ways that you've been able to teach people about intersectionality? This is a good one. <laughs> Does anyone have any thoughts? Let's say I can jump in and then maybe uh, Yosh and Becky have something to add to it. I, I think one thing that I didn't do well, I didn't uh, model this, but I think is continually to talk about that and let that frame all of the conversations and have that intersectionality lens. So uh, part of one way I could have debriefed perhaps better my section uh, was that, that piece, uh, especially around the truth and reconciliation hearings for two-spirit folks, uh, how that's really, so just one example of like maybe a queer identity with an ind indigenous identity, like indigiqueers uh, language some folks would use, uh, how that changes things. Also, even I, I was talking about laws that are Canadian law. So if we think about nation to nation relationships, uh, concept, uh, con you know, the concept of law and what that even means. Uh, and then also this whole presentation has been in English. So there are even just like another layer of language 
uh, we can look a, a lot of ways at how this works. And I think there's overlap of how discrimination and oppression works. Uh, at, at different groups that work similarly, but if we think about different identities and how those things can pile on, uh, that's one way to kind of at least start the conversation and bring it up. Thanks, Jay. I think those are some really, really great points that you've that you've raised there. Anyone else have any thoughts to, to add on around uh, teaching about intersectionality? I feel like I was talking a lot, so I want Becky to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's super super kind. I will go. I, I have two sort of answers to that. Um, so the first one is within our organizational assessment, we really do encourage organizations to spend a lot of time hearing what their stakeholders and community members are saying. And I think that's really important because if you're surveying the folks who are accessing your services and really building um, services based on their needs and what they want, you are actually going to be um, able to, to meet a lot of different folks' needs and identities because you hear what is needed directly from, from the mouths of the humans, right? From the, from, the, from the people who really are creating the reason why we're all doing this work in the first place. Um, and then the other thing I think is really important is, um, to be very intentional in, in, in everything that you do. So <laughs> not answering your question very well by saying everything you do matters and it all kind of feeds into it, but it does. So um, our audit isn't about diversity and it, and it doesn't namely speak um, to things outside of LGBT um, and two-spirit identities, but what has happened in our evaluations has really shown us is that it opens up areas of inquiry into other areas and other identities. And I think oftentimes helps people recognize if you're not inclusive for one population, you're probably not going to be inclusive for another group of humans and, and then how those populations intersect. Um, and then I have lots of ideas around facilitation, but I think this is something that maybe I'll pass back to, back to you two, if that's cool. Yash, do you wanna answer that? Um, I, I think the, one thing I would add to both of your comments is um, uh, I think it, it there's a relationship between practice and learning. So I think if the organization has a culture of, you know, offering just a, a very siloed service or support, right, I'm just going to support mental health needs. I'm not going to look at social prescribing. I'm not going to look at, you know, uh, offering harm reduction services. I'm not going to look at, um, you know, making sure I have some kind of accompaniment with clients to better or safer access to primary care services. I think, I think folks need to start expanding on that idea of you know, ensuring client-centered care with wraparound supports. Um, and if you open that up a little bit about you know, disrupting what your notion of your, of your services, um, then I think you can easily identify those other intersectional opportunities for learning. Awesome, thanks very much, so much for adding on to that and, and, and sharing. Um, so we have another question that's, uh, that's come in now as well. Um, have you had experiences working with LGBTQ2S plus folks in rural communities? And if so, do you find it's more difficult to create an inclusive environment in rural areas compared to urban areas? Interesting question. <laughs> um, I'll answer very quickly and then pass it off to to my lovely friends on the panel. Uh, yes, we have for sure. Um, and I live in Alberta, so there's many rural communities here. Uh, and I would say that um, there is no essentializing answer that I can give to that at all. I think that there are some smaller communities where people are super close knit and um, where no, it's actually been incredibly easy to do this um, because their values are really aligned with acceptance. And then I've also done things in larger organizations within the city where it's been quite difficult. Um, and so I think for me as a, as a human that goes in and, and does consulting and training, it's really important that I'm aware of my own um, biases and assumptions about a group that I'm going to work with because I've often been uh, quite surprised by what the needs are. 
Um, that being said, I think there are some practices that if you're working in a particular community that you're worried about, it is really to think about kind of what are their values and how do their values actually match with the values of inclusion? And then how do you work with those values in a way that builds rapport and relationship as opposed to um, in a confrontational kind of manner? So I will let the other two folks jump in now. Great question. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of <laughs> jump in. Um, I, I, I think the one thing I think is, is, you know, partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. Uh, I think it's very difficult to do otherwise. Um, as Becky mentioned, the centralized service delivery, like that one queer and trans provider that doesn't work. Um, here in Ontario, I think, you know, um, there really needs to be, um, you know, I work in the region of Peel, that is municipalities of Brampton, Mississauga, and Caledon. And Caledon can be quite um, inaccessible in terms of it's a very large geographic area. So um, in terms of accessing services in a timely and effective way, it becomes a bit of a challenge. But I would say partnership um, anchors that ability for you to like, you know, offer those additional supports through other service providers. Um, Any more thoughts to tack on that one, or we have a couple, a uh, couple other we can we can take a look at too. <clears throat> um, okay, so the next one we have here is um, what advice would you give if we wanted to engage the community in uh, program planning or patient family advisory groups to ensure we don't fall into the trap of expecting a few people to speak for a very diverse community? And thanks in advance for your insight. I think we're all very polite. <laughs> um, what I'm going to say about that really quickly is that um, it's really important when you're doing something at an organizational level um, that the humans who you're asking for advice are there voluntarily. They're never sort of pressured to be part of it um, and that we're not assuming that based on someone's identity, they're going to have interest in doing this. Um, I also think it's really important that you find lots and lots of allies within an organization that is actually driving this work forward um, because it shouldn't always be the folks who, um, who have experienced uh, oppression and a lack of inclusion who then also have to educate and drive the change within their organization and drive and really focus on their peers. So finding those allies and stakeholders who are willing to do the work, who are willing to listen to the community about what needs to happen, but actually be the ones implementing the change is so important. Um, because, you know, it's not, it's, it's important for many reasons. And I think one of those is that we really have to stop relying on folks to, to do that for us. It is up to us as a community to work together to create change. I think the only thing I'll add to that, uh, based off what Becky said, said, and kind of what I'm hearing, there's there's like a there's a little bit of like a chicken egg situation where like sometimes if you make the changes, those people will come because that's part of the relationship building rather than like asking the people then to make the changes, and that's not necessarily what this question's asking, but. Um, that's something to think about. And the other thing I was thinking of during this comment is related to the last question. I think, especially in rural areas, to really think about those things. Uh, if a population smaller um, and um, just like from some of my own experiences, right, there's sometimes in a community, there's like the one person who's out and they get asked to do everything. Uh, and like what that can mean and like why aren't why aren't other people out? Um, and again, it goes back to that chicken egg situation. Why is there the one person that's asked to make everything inclusive and other people aren't coming forward? It could be because, um, you know, maybe there are some other steps that can happen that can lead to such a group or folks coming forward or that kind of relationship building. I know it's a very general answer, um, but those are some things to kind of think about. I'm just repeating what Becky already said. So good answer, Becky. <laughs> 
I think that's a really, really great point that you raise and really investigating like also, yeah, what those processes actually actually look like and, and you know, what you are really asking of community and, and how ready, um, you know, is, is the organization to start to, to be a safe place for folks to become involved and engaged in, in working on the change, so yeah. And I'll just say one sentence to add on that. It's, I think sometimes folks worry about doing or saying the wrong thing so they don't do something. Um, and so like, rather than be nervous about that, say the thing. Uh, and if someone says you're wrong, just say, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but like, don't worry so much about being awkward. Um, really do just start kind of changing that, uh, changing things. And, and to Jay's point, like if there is only a couple people you can ask, it is a bigger question. Um, so you really do need to be more comfortable being awkward and maybe making mistakes, but starting to make changes on your own end. Thanks, Becky. Uh, I'm seeing that some folks have added some resources in the chat, which is great. So I'll make sure that anything that was shared um, in the chat gets added into that resource list that we're gonna that we're gonna um, distribute after the webinar as well. So thanks so much, folks. Uh, who've shared some, some great reports and resources in there too. Um, it looks like we have one other question that's maybe a bit more of a comment, but I'll, I'll read it out and then we can see if, if that sparks any, any, um, any thoughts for you folks. Uh, we're getting uh, close to the end of our time together. So um, if anyone else has any, any last question, we probably have, have time to do um, another question. So feel free to uh, type those in if you still have a burning question, but I think, uh, yeah, there's been so much to think about and, and process so far. Um, so let's see, we have um, a comment here in the question box uh, that we need a national and international, um, I guess, organization or body uh, to give training to and for people identifying, relating, and dealing with LGBTQ2S plus communities. Uh, stigma really goes a long way between strangers, open-minded and accepting approach. So I guess this piece here around having a kind of international or international organization responsible for training, I think is, is kind of the, the, what this piece is getting at. I can kind of share something real quick about that. I think, you know, the local context is so important. Um, you know, I look at Toronto where access to a variety of services exists and, and in Peel, it's not so accessible. Um, for folks, but I also just want to quickly add um, the piece, something to the piece around stakeholder engagement. I I reflect on the fact that you know, um, you know, because of COVID, there has been a huge disruption to the services that have or are accessible to queer and trans communities. Um, and I just want to kind of say, you know, HIV, the opioid epidemic the mental health crisis, these are co-occurring epidemics that continue to still have a huge impact on queer and trans communities. Um, UN AIDS, uh, which I just got um, a quick st stat from is, you know, 32.7 million people have died since the HIV AIDS epidemic. So I think the privilege or the ability to, you know, um, have the ability to just say, you know, one, one service over the other or having the privilege to kind of less prioritize a specific service for communities that itself has a huge impact. And I think we need to be more mindful when we start developing our programs and services. So that was a little bit of a rant from my end. I apologize, Laura. No, I think that's that's a really powerful, powerful point to, to put out there. And um, yeah, I mean, I think with that, there doesn't seem to be any more questions that have come through. And I feel like that's kind of a, a powerful piece to end on unless folks have any last, uh, you know, final words you want to slip in. I just, um, I'll uh, quickly, before we let uh, folks go, just say thank you again uh, to everyone, everyone who's participated in today's webinar and everyone, uh, all of our panelists, thank you so much for your really thoughtful, um, thoughtful conversations that we've sparked today and uh, hopefully this uh, yeah we can all move forward in, 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 a, in a good way um, and are motivated <laughs> uh, by today's webinar so thank you so much uh, for, for taking the time and just want to mention that we do have um, that this webinar is part of a series so our next webinar is actually 
uh, this Tuesday coming up <laughs> very quick. So if you're interested in that, um, it's uh, going to be on Tuesday, uh, Tell It Like It Is, Sexual Health and Wellness for Learners with Developmental Disabilities. Um, and the link for registration, uh, I think, I believe was just posted in the chat. And we'll make sure you have that uh, in the follow-up. <clears throat> And again, with Zoom, you can't, I don't think you can actually click on the links here, but uh, we will send the uh, slides. We'll have the link that you can, you can click, uh, but um, a webinar um, evaluation will open when you uh, close the webinar here. So we'd ask you just to please take a minute to fill out our brief and anonymous evaluation survey and your feedback does help us improve future webinars. It should open automatically when you exit the webinar platform. And we'll also share the link in the follow-up email. And uh, as mentioned, the recording will be available on CPHA's YouTube channel in the coming weeks. And lastly, you can find out more about CPHA's STBBI stigma work, including the upcoming webinars in the series uh, by visiting our project webpage. So thanks again, everyone, and have a fabulous afternoon.